Almost everybody in this class, I think, understands the difference between salvation and discipleship. And um, I actually, I had some emails that I, I sent to Lucas. This is Lucas Kitchen. It's, it's not uh, Aaron. <laughs> Lucas. And I was going to do it like as sort of a church-wide thing, and I said, Hey, Lucas, do you have something that's really, really short? Because 33 lessons. I mean, the average person doesn't come here more than once or twice, right? No. So they have to wait for 33 lessons. And they're not going to get the whole thing. So I said, um, he said, well, you know, the videos are short. And I said, well, maybe this just isn't right. So I said, yeah. And now she didn't show up. So <laughs> we'll go ahead and do it anyway. Um, there's a lot of topics, and if we don't get anybody new, um, I would really like to start the Book of Acts, but maybe for a few weeks we'll just do this, and then um, then we can kind of pick up on. What I really wanted to do was to do something like this for the first hour people, and then do Acts for the second hour. Like you guys, who's your second? You could do the axe, right? Yeah, yeah we get the axe. Yeah, <laughs> give them the axe. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is a really neat thing that Lucas put together. He spent a lot of time on this, and uh, that when I was down at the conference, there were, um, he actually had a, one of his sessions where he talked about uh, all of these. This, this series. And since I was going to be talking about rewards... He says it back um, there. The two yeah. differences. So, um, just for the sake of people who are online and don't know what I'm talking about, um, I will read the back of that. Because most people don't have this. Um, is there a difference between salvation and discipleship? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, there is a good reason. Uh, you ain't got her on, huh? She can't hear you. I want that. Derry. Gail. Apologize for not making it. Okay, so. Um, is there a difference between salvation and discipleship? And, and there's, a, there's a couple things that... Um, we might need to observe, okay, about that statement. Okay. So some of you, um, no, no, that's not. Um, Maybe it's one in the other room. In your pocket. Oh, yeah, put it in my pocket. <laughs> you can see that in my pocket. <laughs> okay. So we have salvation. And discipleship. Okay. So, normally in this class, we refer to salvation in three different ways. Remember how we talk about those? Yeah. We talk about, um, first of all, we'll all would be justification salvation, although I don't like that term. But we'll use it anyway, just to be simple. And then sanctification, salvation, set apart. And then glorification, salvation. I just kind of abbreviate these. Sorry for people online that can't see that, this, but so the idea would be. I think a better term for justification, salvation might be a once for all salvation. And then the sanctification salvation is discipleship. So are, are we saying is salvation and salvation the same? <laughs> well, it depends on what kind of salvation you're talking about, right? Yeah. So 
this once for all justification salvation we're calling salvation even though discipleship is salvation too we're growing more and more like Christ we're being saved from the what? what, are, what is sanctification? Salvation. set apart to we're being saved from the first one is being saved from the penalty of sin which is hell Yeah. Well, that, that's a good salvation right? that's a good salvation yeah. <laughs> so that's what he's talking about but this is salvation from the power of sin in our lives, which we might not experience, right? Because salvation, there's a lot of cost to it. And that's a big part of his, Lucas's presentation, is that it's costly. And on his summary here, and we're not going to talk about glorification salvation, because that will be separation, that will be deliverance from uh, the presence of sin. So when we get to heaven, True. we'll no longer have the flesh. We'll be right? glorified then, right? Yeah. So, anyway, I just thought I'd say that because sometimes people will say salvation. I don't see a difference between salvation and discipleship. Well, it depends what kind of salvation you're talking about. Okay. So, salvation is a one-time event, and that's the important part. Right? And it happens the moment someone believes in Jesus for everlasting life. And as he says in this series, it's free. <laughs> it's not costly. It's a gift. Um, and you can never lose it, right? A person uh, uh, gets this kind of salvation, this kind of salvation. Uh, it's permanent. Whoever drinks the water of life you know, we'll never have to drink again. We'll never thirst again. Discipleship, on the other hand, is a lifelong journey that happens as a believer obeys Jesus' commands. Well, do you have a choice of obeying Jesus' commands? Yeah. yeah. Do it. Not recognizing this simple distinction creates confusion. Not explaining the difference allows a mixed message to be spread. Not knowing the difference between salvation and discipleship keeps many people from experiencing either one. I thought that that's a good dis way to describe that. Because if you think that works are involved, at the moment you raise your hand or you go forward or you do something, if you think works are involved when you're doing that, you're not saved. No. Right? Nothing you do. Yeah. And then, if a person thinks that all of these works are necessary for me to get justification, salvation, uh, I'm sorry, that's the opposite way. If you think that um, there is nothing that you have to do to be a disciple, right? Because we just said this is a free gift, right? So if you think discipleship is a free gift, I'll do so. And there's nothing that you have to do. Are you a disciple? Yeah. If you're just sitting in your lounge chair all day, doing nothing, right? That's when you do some work. <laughs> yeah. So, so you won't have either one if you don't understand the difference. It keeps many people from experiencing either one. And if you don't know the difference between salvation and discipleship, um, you're not going to be a disciple. Anyway, to help clear up the confusion, here are some of the many pairs of New Testament terms that show the distinction between salvation and discipleship. And uh, if my internet is working, we'll go ahead and play the first one. There's only 33 of them. Yeah. <laughs> only. Uh, where is my list? Wow. There it is. Okay. Actually, it's not the first one. There's an introduction. Huh. There it is. Looks like it's working.
name is Lucas Kitchen, and welcome to the introduction to our Bible study series, Salvation and Discipleship. Is there a difference? First of all, I want to tell you why you need this Bible study. The Bible teaches that salvation and discipleship are different. Salvation is a one-time event that happens the moment that someone believes in Jesus for everlasting life. Discipleship is a long-term journey that happens when someone obeys Christ on a daily basis. Not recognizing this simple distinction creates confusion. And not knowing the difference between salvation and discipleship keeps many people from experiencing either. This Bible study will chart out and explain 33 different pairs of terms used in the New Testament. This study is specifically designed to clear up confusion about the difference between salvation and discipleship. And I can say from personal experience, until I understood that distinction, I did not understand the Bible. So if you want to understand the Bible, this is going to be a formative experience for you. Now that you know a little bit about what to expect, let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to use to get there. We have a handful of different study materials. The first is this video series. You've already begun. This study is divided up into 33 different topics. Each topic has a short overview video that will give you the lay of the land so that you have a basic understanding of that topic and the distinction that we find there. If you only watch the videos, then great. You'll have a basic understanding of each of those topics. However, I'm hoping that you want to go a little bit deeper. And for that, we've developed a number of study pieces that I think are going to really help you out. First of all, we have the study guide. Right. Now, this study guide is something that you can tuck away <coughs> in your Bible or even carry with you wherever you go. It gives the basic message that I just shared about the difference between salvation and discipleship. And then it also has all 33 topics inside of it. And each of those topics lays out the verses that are both salvation and discipleship oriented. The next study material that we have we call our workbook. If you want to personally interact with the material in this study, this is where you ought to do it. This workbook is beautifully laid out with a great introduction that gives you the same information that we've been talking about so far, but it also has pages for each topic so that you can take notes and you can personally consider what this Bible study is teaching you. It's a great way to send down roots and really understand <coughs> what's going on in this study. And finally, we have the book entitled Salvation and Discipleship, Is There a Difference? This book goes in-depth for each of the topics. It's easy to read, but it gives you the information you need to completely understand the distinction between salvation and discipleship on each of the 33 topics. This is a valuable piece because it's going to take you deeper than what you'll get in the video or what you'll get in the workbook. You can also get it in audiobook if you prefer that format. The cool thing about all this is it's free on our website in digital format. So if you want to download it for free, go to simplybelief.com slash grow. If you prefer a hard copy, you can order... Let me try using the YouTube navigator here. I can write all in person now. What would you say if I told you I have a free gift for you, but it's going to cost you everything you owe? You probably say, that's not a gift, that is a purchase, my friend. Hey, I'm Lucas Kitchen, and welcome to episode one of Salvation and Discipleship, Is There a Difference? So have you ever heard that phrase, salvation is free, but it will cost you everything? I know that for me, it confused me for years. And so in this episode, what I want to do is I want to talk about what the Bible says is free, and what it says is costly. So if you have your study guide, go ahead and open it up to the first panel. And on the first panel, you'll notice that topic number one is free and costly. So let's look at the verses that we find under topic number one. The first is Romans 6, 23. 
Let's see what it says. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want you to notice a very important word in there. It's the word gift. Eternal life, which is a synonym for salvation, is a gift. It's given by God. So by definition, a gift means that it must be free. In fact, that's what our next verse is going to tell us. Let's turn over to Revelation 22, 17. Here's what it says. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So we know that the water of life is salvation because Jesus uses that term to describe salvation to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. So it says here that salvation can be taken freely. So not only is it a gift, but it's a free gift. So we know for sure that salvation is a free gift. That means that you can't earn it with good works. But that brings up an important question. If we can't earn our salvation with good works, why does the Bible spend so much time telling us the good works we should do? Why is the Bible so concerned with how we live if how we live is not how we get our salvation? Well, we actually can find the answer to that pretty simple. Let's turn over to Luke 14, 26-33. It says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So then he goes on to explain what it means to count the cost. And he gives a couple of examples of that. And then he hits us with this. So, likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. So there are a lot of people that teach that Jesus is saying here that you can't be saved unless you do this list of things, this list of good works. So some people say that you can't be saved unless you love Jesus so much more than your family that it looks like you hate your family. Some people say you can't be saved unless you take up your cross and follow Jesus. Some people say you can't be saved unless you count the cost and be a disciple. Some people say you can't be saved unless you forsake all of your worldly possessions. So what gives? In one place it says that salvation is a free gift, but here it's talking about cost. Well, if you are among the people who say that this is talking about salvation, I would challenge you to find the word salvation in this passage. You're not going to find it. But what you will find is a different word entirely. He cannot be my disciple. So this is telling people what will disqualify them from discipleship. And he explains that discipleship is going to cost you something. So in one place it says that salvation is free, but in another it says discipleship is costly. Where salvation determines where you will spend eternity, discipleship determines how you will spend eternity. Salvation is about faith alone in Christ. Discipleship is about works and reward. So, we know that salvation and discipleship are not the same thing because one is free and the other is costly. Good. Okay, now I know you guys already understand that. Yeah. But I thought that was a good presentation of it. Yeah. Well, and, uh, you've got to live a good <coughs> life to disciple somebody else, right? If you're not living good, how can I disciple the other guy? It's not going to give you salvation. That's a good explanation there. It's more could, could you end up naked in heaven? <laughs> <laughs> According to Earl Rodmacher, yes. Yeah. <laughs> more that you want to be in the seat. Everything's burned up. It's like... No. <laughs> but anyway, so discipleship does have to do with with rewards. Now I was. I was going to kind of skip ahead here because I wanted to talk about rewards today. So I was going to skip ahead to number 15. Although there is, 14 is the judgment seat of Christ. Do you want to, want to do that one? Since you were just talking about it? 15. The great white throne versus the judgment seat of Christ. Let's do that one. Yeah. We can kind of go with the flow here. 
Do you know the difference between the white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ? Well, you're about to. Hey, I'm Lucas Kitchen, and this is episode 14 of Salvation and Discipleship. Is there a If you've got your study guide, which you can get at simplybelief.com slash grow, you'll notice that under salvation we have the great white throne judgment, and under discipleship we have the judgment seat. Of Christ. So, let's take a look first at the White Throne Judgment to find out what it's all about. Starting in chapter 20, verse 10, it says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So, this is, you could say, the preamble to the White Throne Judgment. This sets the stakes. So we understand that at this point in history, Jesus has finally come to a place where he's going to begin to cast people into the lake of fire. With this understanding of how high these stakes are, the next section opens up. Let's take a look at that. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found no place for him. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. Okay, I want to pause there. We're going to read on in a second. But we need to understand these two books. And it tells us what these two books are. One, it says that, the books are open. That's plural. And then it tells us that people will be judged by what's written in those books, and what's written in those books is works. So we'll call those the books of works. What is currently being written in those books is all of the works that people have done throughout their entire lives. But then there's another book that's going to be open at this judgment, and it is the book of life. So in the book of life, we know from other places, is written all people who have believed in Jesus, all people who are saved. Okay, So we have these two books, and both will be considered at this judgment. Now we find out who is going to appear at this judgment in this same section. John calls him the dead. In another place, in the Gospel of John, he calls unbelievers the dead who will be resurrected for this event. So we know that these are unbelievers. These are people who were kept in what we might call sort of a holding tank that he calls Hades and death, and they're brought out, physically resurrected, to stand judgment before this white throne. So this is a judgment of only unbelievers. We know that from the context. Now let's read on to find out what happens. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So these unbelievers come out of these holding tanks for the dead, and they stand judgment. And then it says that actually two things happen. It says, number one, that they're judged by their works. And then number two, it says that the book of life is checked to see if they will go into the lake of fire. So what we find out here is that being judged by their works is different than determining their eternal destination. Their eternal destination is determined by whether or not their name is found in the book of life. So then what is the being judged by their works? Why are they judged by their works if their destination is set already based on the book of life? Well, we find out from a number of other places that people's eternal experience in hell is actually going to be different based on their works. In fact, Jesus said about a certain town, he said that their experience on Judgment Day is actually going to be more tolerable. So we find Jesus talking about hell in terms of tolerability. And you may not think of hell that way. Your vision of hell may come from popular books like Dante's Inferno or movies that you've seen like Little Nicky or something like that. 
But what Jesus says is that some people's experience in hell will be more tolerable than others. So, hell is a place of at least some tolerability. Now, that doesn't mean that it's a good place, or it doesn't mean that it's a place that anybody wants to go, but it is, in some ways, at least tolerable, and for some groups, more tolerable than others. So that means that when Jesus judges these unbelievers by their works, he's not determining their destination. That's determined by the Book of Life. At this point, he's determining what their experience is going to be like in hell. If they have mostly good works, but they never believed in him, their experience will be more tolerable, and vice versa. So, that's the white throne judgment. It's all about unbelievers, and the way to avoid the white throne judgment is by believing in Christ. In fact, in John 5.24, that's what Jesus tells us, that those who believe in him will be able to skip this judgment. Did you know, however, that there is another type of judgment that is only for believers? We find its name in 2 Corinthians 5.10. So let's take a look at that. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, if you come from a traditional church, you probably have been told that salvation is not about works. And that's absolutely true. However, Paul does tell us that our works do matter as believers. Our salvation is not established because of our works, but our discipleship is. And in fact, when we stand before Christ, we're going to have to give an account. And it tells us that that account is based on what we've done in the body these mortal bodies currently. And that means the body since we believe. So from the moment when you first believed in Jesus for everlasting life, an account is being kept. And we know that that account exists because we saw it at the white throne judgment. Here we find out that Jesus is going to expect <coughs> us to give an account for everything we've done at this event called the Judgment Seat of Christ. Now, let me give you just a little bit of historical background on what that term means. The words Judgment Seat actually come from a Greek term called the Bema. The Bema was this kind of bench seat that a Roman governor or official or even Caesar himself would sit on to hear cases and to hand down decisions. So, it is a place where he would do judgments in a court kind of a sense. But there was another thing that would happen at the Bema as well. In athletic competitions, that same official would sit on the Bema seat and he would reward the winners of those competitions. It might be a laurel or a wreath or something like that, but he would pass out rewards. So the Bema, the judgment seat, is a place where both judgments and rewards are passed out. Now this is tremendously different from the Great White Throne Judgment. At the Great White Throne Judgment, there were no rewards to be passed out. But at the Judgment Seat of Christ, both judgments and rewards will be passed out. There's another great description of the Judgment Seat of Christ that we find in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. So let's start in verse 11. Here's what it says. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So, this is really important. It calls Jesus Christ the foundation. If you're a believer, when you stand before Jesus, your foundation, your salvation foundation, is Jesus Christ. There was this house in the neighborhood where I grew up that burned to the ground, but it had a concrete slab. That foundation remained for years and years. In fact, we would ride our bikes around on it. So no matter what happens at this judgment, the least you can walk away with is your salvation. That foundation, Jesus Christ, will not be burned up in this experience no matter what happens. So you have that foundation if you've believed in Jesus for everlasting life, and you can't lose it. But, so he's going to go on and tell us that we are supposed to build on top of that foundation. Let's see how he puts it. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. So what he's saying here is that Jesus Christ is your foundation. 
That is your salvation that was given to you when you believed in Jesus for everlasting life. But then, from that moment on, you are a construction worker. So as a disciple, you either can build with good works or you can decide not to. And in fact, everything you do in your life is an act of building on this construction site. And so there are different building materials available. So good works are represented by gold, silver, and precious stones. But then bad works, or useless works, we might say, are represented by wood, hay, and straw. So from that moment when you first believe and you have that foundation, there's this hope and expectation that you will build with gold, silver, and precious stones. But if you waste your time and do no good works or very little good works, it's as if you're building with wood, hay, and straw. And then he says that it will be tested by fire. So it's sort of as if at this judgment, Jesus lights a match and throws it into your construction zone. If you built this building with good works, gold, silver, and precious stone, then it's not going to burn up. But if you've built with wood, hay, and straw, you better step back because things are about to get hot. So let's read on and see what happens. Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So what it tells us is that when Jesus throws this match into this metaphorical building, the fire will sweep through. And whatever's left is what you will be rewarded for. So if you've built with lots of gold, silver, and precious stones, then you will receive lots of reward. If you've built with wood, hay, and straw, and he throws that match in and it's all burned up, you will receive no reward. Now, it's very important that we understand the difference between a gift and reward. Salvation is a gift. We don't work for it. We can't earn it. But a reward is like being paid for your construction work. A reward is like your paycheck. It's what you get when you do something and it comes as a result. Think about that Bema seat where the official passes out laurels or wreaths to an athlete who has earned a position of honor. So, the reward is what a believer gets for doing good works. Now, if you're like me and come from a traditional background, it was drilled into my head that salvation is not about good works. And so I got it in my mind that that means that we really don't have to worry about doing good works. But that's absolutely wrong. Our eternal reward is at stake if we don't do good works. And it's the judgment seat of Christ where all of that will be considered and looked at, and he will pass out rewards. It's important to see this last line here. It says, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So what that tells us is that there are believers out there who have everlasting life, but do absolutely nothing with it. They'll be saved, but it's as if everything they've done from the moment when they believe will be burned up. They'll enter heaven almost as if they're naked. I mean, imagine somebody passing through fire, even their clothes burn up. They enter the kingdom of heaven with nothing to their name. It says that they will suffer loss, and that is in heaven. They will suffer loss in the kingdom of heaven because they did nothing with their life once they became a believer. But, praise the Lord, they will be saved. It's a beautiful thing. It's a reassurance of salvation, but it's a reminder that not only should we have our salvation in place, but we also need to work as disciples. If you want to go deeper on this subject, I would highly recommend you get my book, Salvation and Discipleship is Very Difference. There is so much in this chapter that just can't fit in a short video like this. We also have a Bible study workbook, a study guide. Go to simplybelief.com slash grow to get signed up for this Bible study and get notifications. I, I was always taught that um, there are works that we do in our own strength that are the wood, hay, and stubble. And the works done by the power of the Holy Spirit, which bring glory to God, we got the glory with the wood, hay, and stubble works. But uh, the works done by the power of the Holy Spirit are the uh, gold, silver, and precious stones. 
Um, so is that a question or an observation? <laughs> observation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. And I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm looking through here because I, I brought I brought my Richard Strauss tapes here uh, because I thought we were going to be talking about rewards. But, five of them, isn't uh, Anyway, but to, to follow along with what Kim was saying, um, and that, that actually relates to this because uh, one of the the subjects is. Um, how do we build with materials that don't burn? So I, th I think that relates to what you were asking. And um, so each one of these tapes I actually summarized in one, one statement. And uh, so there are some other ways of studying these things. But, but when you think about it, um, I don't. I don't know uh, how how to. Uh, I, I think that's correct that uh, if if you do things without depending upon God, that uh, I mean, it could. You're talking about good things, right? Like doing good things without depending upon. Or to get um, noticed yourself or something, or uh -huh. or in the your motives. Own, in your own strength, in other words. Absolutely. I don't know. I have to think about that one. Because even if you're doing it in your own strength, um, you're still you're still doing something for the Lord. Okay, even if you're doing it in your own strength. But I don't know. What was? Well, just that the rewards um, you can get on earth, but not in heaven. I don't know. Yeah, if you're pleasing man, it. not the, you know, you'll get your reward right there. Yeah, I guess you're, you're talking more about motives. Yeah. Right? Not what you're doing. Like, when you think of right. doing something good, like you're, you're serving in, in a, yeah. a breakfast mission, or you're on a mission trip, or, you know, you're doing these things uh, in your flesh uh, for recognition. Yeah. So people would pat you on the back when you come back to church. That's your reward, yeah. <laughs> I think, is that what you meant? Yes, that, and also yeah. the the uh, power to to do it. Yeah, I think I would agree. But you know, when when I was listening to this, I'm thinking about how mixed my motives might be sometimes, because yeah. we're not always perfect with our motives. I think that comes with Christian growth, right? Yeah. It says there's a reward if you're just looking for Jesus to come back. You even get that because you're mm -hmm. wishing. You want him coming back. You're thinking of him. Yeah. That's one reward. There's five of them all together, I read in a, in a book at home. Is that right? Um, well, there's more than five places that it talks about rewards in the Bible. But don't we lay them right at Christ, Christ's feet when we go? Um, metaphorically, yeah, meta maybe. But that they're, they were going to... He, he didn't have time to really go into it. He, that's but good. But there will be... Uh, places of honor and uh, places of ruling and reigning with Christ when he comes in his kingdom. So some people will be ruled over ten cities, some people will be ruled over one city. So there's like distinctions. Uh, and, and Jody Dillow uses the illustration, he says, um, some people think that when they die and go to the Bama seat, the judgment seat, that God will hit this reset button. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Reset, and then everybody's the same, right? Well, everybody won't be the same. That's what, that's the purpose of the judgment. I always told him I wanted to rule over Marcus Oak, Linwood, and Hawaii. That will sound like I'm going to get to meet any of the big guys. Yeah, <laughs> Abraham, Isaac, and Jerry. You'll see them when you get there. I was just looking at a passage that talked about sitting down with I don't even think I'll get to catch up with Billy Graham. Oh. Well, he's going to have Hopefully, well, no comment. But They'll have any rewards for Billy Graham for what he'd done. Um, again, it goes back to motive. Motive, yeah. If he's giving an unclear gospel with a good motive, will he be rewarded? 
Not if it's not clear. No. Not it's not. It's not going to get as much reward as if he had a clear gospel, right? Remember the video I played? Yeah. That was terrible. It was very unclear. But I mean, Billy Graham isn't. That's from what I hear about him, he never sought glory for himself. Nah, no, that's not right. Yeah, I mean, you want to, I don't even think he wanted to be called Doc. Yeah. So his motives were probably yeah. pretty good, right? So, but this, this uh, I don't know, I've talked about this several times. And maybe we should do a series on uh, rewards, because he breaks it down so that you can really understand. I mean... What are the rewards? How do we build? Rewards for suffering. What kind of attitudes? Crowns? What are the crowns? Uh, investing in e How do we invest in eternity right now, today? Um, how do we lay up treasures in heaven? Jesus said lay up treasures, treasures in heaven. It's like, well, how in the world do I do that? <laughs> you know, what are some practical steps in uh, rewards for faithful service? And just being faithful. You didn't do any great things. Nobody even knows your name. But you were faithful. There's going to be rewards for that. Um, our work, our work, our employment as being a gift from God. How do we do our jobs to gain rewards in heaven? If you're honest. Have you ever any, heard anyone give a message on that? No. How do you do yeah. Or how do you do you use your retirement to gain rewards in heaven? You're not going to be sitting around on a cloud up there, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to give you a job. But aren't they great subjects? I mean, there's there's 12 of them. And then you can lose your reward. His last message is on how to maintain your reward. Because you, you could theoretically lose. I don't think you could lose all your rewards, but you could yeah, lose I've heard that where you could lose some them. of them. And they'd be good, a good worker on your job, honest, doing an honest job. Okay, so we listened to one, two messages, so we'll wrap it up. That's a good laugh. Did you, did you enjoy that? I like that. I can't promise what we'll do next week. But that, that's some lot of people in this church here. They all, all here, all here, that's right. Well, I don't know what else to try. <laughs> I've tried everything. I, I, I think we got the right idea from me. Let's meet up there where all the food is. Yeah. It seems like wherever you got, got Christians, you got food that around. Maybe I can open up my laptop up there and do a preview of what we'll be talking about. This would be interesting, <laughs> everybody. And I said, well, if you want to discuss this and see and participate, why don't you come down and join us? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm just. If you would like, show some of that to take a look at it, what's your feature? Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we, we thank you for uh, everything we talked about today and. Uh, some of it sort of convicting and uh, help us to uh, walk close to you so that we, we know our motives are good and uh, even though we're far from perfect and when you know a lot will burn up even with the best of us that we pray that, that the part that remains will, will glorify you to, the, to as, as best we can we pray this in Christ's name amen yeah.